It was the best of times and the worst of times during the early 20th century for African Americans. Being black, or colored, as we were sometimes affectionately called, meant we faced many challenges, meant we weren't welcomed in mainstream American life. It meant we were voiceless faces facing huge obstacles just to survive. During this time, there were very few blacks of this era who ventured to declare their own sexual orientation. Homosexuality was anything but public. But for those brave African Americans who were comfortable about their sexuality, it was a time of their own evolutionism. Langston Hughes, he achieved fame as a poet during the Harlem Renaissance. However, he was also a novelist, a columnist, a playwright, and an essayist. His world travels influenced his writing in a profound way. Langston had become the second African American to earn a living as a writer. His long and distinguished career produced volumes of diverse genres and inspired the work of countless other African American writers. Hughes was one of the celebrated talents who flourished during the Harlem Renaissance. And like others active in the Harlem Renaissance, Hughes had a strong sense of racial pride. Through his poetry, his novels, his plays, his essays, and his children's books, he promoted equality, condemned racism and injustice, and celebrated African American culture. Zora Neale Hurston. She was by far the most prolific and accomplished black woman writer in America. From the 1930s to the 1960s, she gained a reputation as an outstanding folklorist and novelist. Hurston often called attention to herself because she insisted upon being herself during a time when blacks were urged to assimilate in an effort to promote better relations between races. I do not belong to that sovereign school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low-down, dirty deal. Hurston, however, saw nothing wrong with being black. She indeed felt that her blackness was something special and that others could benefit just by being around her. Zora's works included the masterpieces like Imitation of Life and Their Eyes Were Watching God. Wallace Thurman, or Wally as he was commonly known with his friends, was one of the most versatile writers of the Harlem Renaissance. In 1926, Thurman became editor of The Messenger and published one issue of the literary magazine, Fire, which was collaborated with Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes. In 1929, Thurman's play Harlem debuted on Broadway. That same year, his novel, the Black or the Berry, was, and still is, a groundbreaking piece of work because its focus on intra-racial prejudice within the black community is still being read today. Bayard Rustin was by far a pioneer that was way beyond his years and time. Rustin's assistance in the civil rights movement, though briskly noted, has by far shown its impact on the community as a whole. From the organization of the Montgomery bus boycott, which led to the historic Supreme Court decision, to the highly successful March on Washington and Dr. King's historic speech, to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was formed by Dr. King and Rustin, and is still operational today as an organization committed to using nonviolence in the struggle for civil rights. In his final years, Rustin was active in his protests against the Vietnam War and in the gay rights movement. In 1986, Rustin claimed, the barometer of where one is on human rights questions is no longer the black community, it's the gay community, because it is the community which is most easily mistreated. Audre Lorde, critically acclaimed novelist, poet, and essayist, defined herself as a black lesbian feminist. And when asked to define lesbian, in typical Audre Lorde style, she replied, Strongly woman-identified women where love between women is open and possible, beyond physical in every way. While black sisters don't like to hear this, I would have to say that all black women are lesbians because we were raised in the remnants of a basically matriarchal society, no matter how oppressed we may have been by patriarchy. We're all dykes, 
including our mamas. Lord wrote from the heart. She wrote of racism in the feminist movement, sexism among African Americans, and of lesbians and love. She wrote for women who had no voice of their own, who were terrified to speak because they were taught to respect fear more than themselves. James Baldwin was a vital literary voice during the civil rights era. At the age of 14, Baldwin was a preacher at a small fireside Pentecostal church in Harlem. After he graduated high school, he moved to Greenwich Village and in the early 1940s, transferred his faith from religion to literature. Baldwin's first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, is a partial autobiographical account of his young life. In 1948, Baldwin left the United States, made prime residence in the south of France, only to return part-time in 1957. The impact was reflective of his works. Novels like Giovanni's Room, which was about a white American expatriate who must come to terms with his homosexuality, and Another Country, about racial and gay sexual tensions among New York intellectuals. His inclusion of gay themes resulted in a lot of savage criticism from the black community. Baldwin's plays provided powerful descriptions of American racism. As an openly gay man, he became increasingly outspoken in condemning discrimination against lesbian and gay people. Now that we've had an opportunity to look back into the 20th century, it's time we now stand and look into the 21st century. It's time we looked at where we need to go. Pioneers like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, and Pat Parker have done the work for our generation. And it's our job to either improve on what they've done or initiate something new for the next generation of black gays and lesbians. It's time we ask the question, what does it mean to be black and gay in America today? As far as me, I'm black first. Um, the, you see me first, you see I'm black. You see the skin color, can't be mistaken. The gay thing is secondary. Um, I, I, I guess I'm trying to think about me. I don't think of myself as gay, even though I know I am. I don't hide it. You know, I'm not in the closet. It's just that that label is not as important to me. You know, I'm a black man first, and then I'm a gay man. I don't know, um, Ken, I can't really say that. I know that this seems like I backpedal a little bit, but, you know, in terms of my sexuality, there's a certain fluidity to it, you know. Um, times when I think, uh, when I've shared my life uh, with a woman and found that deep bond and was ready to make that commitment, then, of course, I felt most possessed to claim that. Um, I consider myself, as I said to you earlier, a bisexual individual. I like women sexually. Occasionally, I may have sex with a woman. Do I want to be in a relationship with a woman? No. But I like women sexually. I think it's, for me, and I, I think it's very exciting. Um, it's very, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. And the reason I say that is because I feel it inside. And, once, and since I feel it inside, I can, I can say it. I can come out and do it. Um, I, I think it's just to be 
maybe if I could steal the phrase or borrow the, uh, uh, the phrase that we're using for this year's Black Gay Pride to live in our pride and to be proud of who you are, not just of being black or African American, but being proud of you, uh, of what God made you in terms of your orientation as well. And nobody chooses to be gay. At least I don't know anybody that did. So to, be, to, have, to not let that pride in with our culture uh, in terms of our race, but to let that begin with our culture in terms of our sexual Well, behavior. as I enter into my pre-eldership time in life, <laughs> it means power. It means that I've, I've already been angry, you know, I've already been hurt, I've already worked hard, I've already um, seen a lot of my dreams come true, things that I didn't think were possible have happened. And uh, what I know is that at the end of the day, I have to have I have to be a good person. It means never, ever giving up. And I say that because at one point, to me, being black and gay in America meant to uh, commit suicide. It meant to, to live in a, a constant state of just sadness and depression and no one will ever understand me and no one will ever love me and my family will reject me and, and you know, I can't, I can't. But today it's not like that. It's about um, never giving up. It's about always moving forward and believing that just because I am black and gay doesn't mean that I am not a viable member, member of society and that I, I can and I do contribute much to society and I'm okay and so is everyone else just like me. So it's cool. I think that it means to have two great traditions of activism at your disposal. I think that the tradition of black liberation and the tradition of gay liberation both inform what it means to be black and gay in America today. Wow, to be black and gay in America. Um, I think it means to be a jumbled, mixed, harmonious, crazy, bag of things. I think it's, it's a series of contradictions. I think it means that I'm someone whose history is rooted both in Stonewall and the Civil Rights Movement. It means that I am someone who, whose ancestors shed the chains of slavery and I can proudly walk down the street wearing a pink t-shirt. Um, it means that I have a place in the modern civil rights movement and also like to shop. Um, <laughs> I think it means it's sort of a combination of all of those things. I, yeah, for me, I think, you know, a lot of people think that you either have to be black or you have to be gay. And for me, I think there's something wonderful when you choose to be both those things. Um, Audre Lorde, who's another inspiration of mine, used to start out um, many first speeches by saying, when I woke up this morning, I was a lesbian, and then 15 minutes later, I was black. Then after that, I was a woman. Then I was a cancer survivor. And she would always say, don't divide me against myself. And I know for myself, I take that to be a personal motto throughout my day that I don't want anyone else to divide me against myself and I'm not going to divide myself against myself either. Based on a true story, it is, um, I explore um, the theme of codependency and two women, two, uh, two wonderful women get together, um, both have not resolved some issues from their past. They fall in love and almost immediately um, the trigger of that intense passion begins to make one of them unravel. 
and uh, she can't get a handle on it. And as a result, she did, then begins to pull her, her lover, in spite of her uh, intentions not to, down with her. So that is um, it. So the rest you have to, you have to check it out and see. That lets you know it's good, it's sexy, it's intense. And um, so that is what it's about. Um, and like I said, it is based on a true story between two women that occurred in Atlanta um, in the spring of 1993. So that titillates people too. What happened? What was it? So it did create a fervor of controversy as the, the film does the same thing. Uh, the Ski Trip is this wonderful, quirky, little romantic comedy about finding ourselves. Um, it centers around this black gay man who's 30 years old and feels like his life is over because his boyfriend just dumped him and he ain't got no money and he hasn't been to the gym all year. Um, and so we sort of follow him and these group of friends and his best friend in particular. And there's sort of this, you know, love, tension, romance between the two of them. Um, but it's really about finding ourselves. It's about acceptance. It's about realizing that love is there for all of us. And sometimes we just have to open up our eyes and take a chance and grab it. Um, I'm very, very proud of the film. It's great because we've screened it across the country for folks that are black, white, gay, straight, male, female. And they've loved it because they really don't center in on the sexuality because it's not about being gay it's just about being human and we all fall in and out of love and we've all we have all made the wrong choices um and uh i think people relate to that they relate to the the human factor the fallibility um the mistakes that we all make when we're you know falling in and out of relationships It's a story about a young man searching for love, and he has a group of friends that's trying to help him understand, as they too search for and try to get a better understanding of love. Uh, the young man eventually finds it. The question is then, can he keep it? Because a lot of times it's not about getting the love, it's about keeping that love. Because we all have had opportunities where we have experienced love and know love and yada 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 with love but uh, it's that process of understanding what it is to try to hold on to it or try to get a grasp of it so therefore you can you know mold it into what it is and what it should be um, it's a story about beginnings it's a story about endings it's a story about fear it's a story about uh, wow so many different things uh, my first book is the bulging stories it's a um collection of linked stories published by Red Bone Press and it, um, it is, the central um, character is someone named Bulldog Jean and Bull Jean lives in different geographic locations, different lifetimes, uh, different time periods trying to learn her life lesson which is to love herself. Uh, Bull Jean is what we would call a butch um, lesbian um, and her language when she speaks is poetry. So I wanted this butch person to have to connect with her heart, and I wanted to um, work on both breaking stereotypes of butch women and also encourage um, um, that in, encourage a softer side, a more complex side of butch women. Uh, so, so when Bulljean speaks in the book, it's through poetry. Sometimes they're songs, but they're they're poetry based. Uh, my second book is called Love Conjure Blues, and it came out uh, not too long ago. Um, and it is, I feel, it's the piece that I've written that I feel I have most fully articulated myself. So it's a jazz piece 
And as Wynton Marcellus says, blues is the rue of jazz, so there's a lot of blues sensibilities in the piece. But the living, the dead, the past, the future, um, all exist at the same time. Um, and it is for the purpose of really talking about love. Ancestral love, carnal love, because a lot of things happen in the juke joint, uh, which to me, I'm using as a way to talk about ritual. Um, you know, family love, um, love of dreams, life, and you know, through the course of love, some of the um, things that we have, the challenges and things that we have to, to learn and overcome. It's called the Brunch it's Conversations Networking Group. <laughs> I'm smiling now because I never thought that it would evolve into anything noteworthy of, or worthy of this. Um, I think it just started out of frustration, um, out of me sensing a need for the BLGT community to have a place and an opportunity to come together um, to fellowship with one another and to utilize the resources that exist within our community so that we can answer some of the difficult questions, um, create an atmosphere where we can heal, unite, and empower each other. So that's sure. what In I In the Life Atlanta started back in 1996. It started mainly because there were African Americans who were coming to Atlanta to celebrate Pride or celebrate Labor Day weekend. And so then it got incorporated into a Pride celebration. We started the formulation of In the Life Atlanta. And our mission statement is to meet the needs and serve the people of African descent who happen to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. So what we do, we have a series, we are starting a series of programs around social issues, uh, economic issues, pol uh, po political, and things like that just to encompass um, all people so that we can celebrate who we are. We are the official organizers of Black Gay Pride in Atlanta, which will ha it happens every Labor Day. And so we, we bring in uh, quite a lot of people. Last year it was 37,000 people that ascended on Atlanta. And now our pride is the largest in the country and maybe even in the world. 1989 with myself and a transgender by the name of Edna Brown. And the reason we started the agency is because there weren't anyone in Atlanta doing anything around HIV and black. I write and teach on womanism and black feminism and also on African American lesbian and gay studies. And that encompasses not only lesbian and gay people, but also lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and same gender loving people, also queer and questioning people. misconception is probably that there isn't a lot of joy there. Um, I am happy as a tangerine on Christmas to be black and gay. I am. I think it's fantastic. Um, and I really enjoy the black gay community. I do. I, I've been so blessed this last year to be able to tour and go to different cities and hang with different communities. And I love the combination, you know, of voguing and barbecue and, um, you know, balls and fried fish sandwiches. I think it's great. I think it's the best combination of things in the world. So I think that's probably the misconception, is that there isn't a lot of joy in our community um, because we hear so much about HIV infection, we hear so much about being on the down low, we hear so much about homophobia, but the flip side of it, I think, is that there is a wonderful community um, all across this country um, that unites and celebrates being both gay and being black. Um, that we are sinners, you know, that we're sinful that we're dirty, that we are, people need to protect their children from us, that we are not loving, that we are, I mean, it's too, it's so many, it's, I think it's a box with about a hundred of them in there, um, but at, I think it kind of all centers around the misconception that we are um, really just not human, that we don't have, 
that we don't house humanity. That two men or two women can't genuinely love each other. And that it is um, primarily bred in sex. And I believe that that is the biggest misconception. The idea that love between a man and a man or a woman and a woman is something that is not possible. That just baffles my, my mind whenever I'm confronted with that argument with people. Recently, last summer, I had an argument with someone that lasted almost four and a half hours, um, saying that it's impossible for a man to love another man, and that my lover and I were just wasting time. <laughs> Interesting. I don't see it as so different from heterosexuals, in the sense it's going to be the same violence, the same fighting, the same heartbreak, the same lies, the same, all of those things. But, um, you know, I think time is of the essence with us. And, you know, until we collectively come together and see that it is a mutual struggle for liberation and that until we begin to see our lives reflected in mainstream culture, honestly and truly, not stereotypically, we will it will feed into the sense of inferiority that we experience and feel and it will get us nowhere. It will be circuitous, you know. That we're what they see on television. And that ties right into the last conversation that we had at the last brunch, um, images and media. Um, we have... Uh, Kind of a one-dimensional image, in my opinion, um, of what our community is and looks like and who we are. And it's certainly not balanced or anyone that I know that I can um, identify with. I think there are outside. two kinds of misconceptions that the mainstream black community has about its gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer members. One misconception is that we're somehow different in ways that should exclude us from community membership. While there are differences uh, between us and people who have different kinds of relational orientations, in the main we were raised in those same communities and we carry basically the same values and the same interests as other members of that community. So I think that that's one misconception. Another misconception is that we should stay silent about who we are. I think that a lot of people really buy into the belief of don't ask, don't tell, or you know, it's all right if we don't mention it. But I think that those days are past. I think that it's time for the black community to accept that black people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer have not only every right to speak out about their experiences, but that the community as a whole benefits when they do speak out. I think we have some issues to deal with. Um, I guess our own sexuality. You know, we have people that want to say they own the DL or they in the closet or they're only gay when they go out. So I think that self-esteem issue and us accepting who we are is a The large biggest problem. misconception is, I think they, it is about the partying. That was about 24 by 7 once you come here. And the, the behavior, the sexual misconduct that, that may happen or may not happen. And that the lifestyle is so perverted and child molesters and, 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 that, and that, that type of information. A lot of people get that from the, the media and because they're not aware. And it's just lack of awareness to see really what's going on. change one thing about the African-American faith community. Um, I think that we are not as unified as we should be. If we could think more as a community, like the white gay community, I think we would have, have advanced a lot more than we have. We don't have that unity. Um, we're always splitting ends or pulling each other apart. So I think that's one of the problems that we face as black people. Some of the sickness that actually, I think, manifests within the community around sexuality is other people's sickness. It was not me, you know? The, the ways that people hush and hide and lie and still do everything, you know? 
is the sickness, not me as an out queer person. I think if I could, I don't know that I would change it because I think our pain is important and our pain, we get strength from our pain and our challenging situations. Um, but there is, the flip side I think of being black again in this country is that there is a lot of sadness. I've known a lot of people who lost, who, uh, who had bad relationships with their families when they came out. Um, we've lost a number of wonderful and important people um, to the AIDS epidemic in our community. And so, well, I wouldn't change the pain, because I think we learn from it, um, it saddens me. One of the things that concerns me greatly is the relationship between various religious communities and black, gay, and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer people. Um, I see a lot of conflicts in individuals who belong to religious communities who are trying to develop their spirituality and affiliate with religious or spiritual communities who often aren't ready for their presence as gay or lesbian people. And often individuals who are gay or lesbian find rejection um, within their religious community. So I view that the religious domain is an area where we really need to do some work. Historically, black churches and um, mosques and other religious organizations have been a place of strength and um, balm for members of the black community. The same thing should be true for black, gay, and lesbian people. I would change the depression. Um, I spent many, many years uh, disliking myself for who I was. And uh, the pain, <laughs> the loneliness, the pressure, the, the expectations, the, uh, oh my God, it was horrific. It was horrible. I, I, I would change that. I would change the way that people teach their children um, that, you know, it's, 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 it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, or not Eve and Eve, or whatever. But I would definitely change that. Um, because what we do is we, 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 uh, uh, my self-esteem was like so low growing up. And even when I first, you know, came out into the life, get, got into the life, it was so low. And I didn't know how to love myself. I didn't know how to, um, love people who would love me for me, you know, it was amazing what I allowed happen to me and what I did to other people out of a lack of love. So I would change that. I would change the whole way we, we view each other and our world. You know, we are all human. We are here, you know, experiencing life. Wow. Let each other experience, let us experience it in our own unique way without judging. Let's, 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 let's love each other more. Let's embrace each other more and stop putting, uh, rivers between us and, and, and destroying communication and, and living in this top bottom masculine feminine this that world is ah it's crazy stop that shit it's stupid and I'm sick of it you know grow beyond that you know be more I think I would change the stakes they're so high um, to be an artist and to be gay whereas when most people face up to themselves and their truths, it may make people feel uncomfortable and they may lose a friend or two, but you talk about, in terms of this, losing potentially everything, you know, the crux of the family, lifelong childhood friends, um, your life, your livelihood, the stakes are just too high. And it takes a certain kind of person, and think think of it this way: the stakes are so high, and the price is losing everything. And the only thing that helps to deal with losing everything is the thing you lose: <laughs> the family, the friends, the, the your spirituality. Be it if you prescribe to any particular religious, you know, dogma or whatever. I think that is it. It's, you know, you have to dig, dig, dig so deep. But I, I think, you know, we choose our lives at the gate of it all. And when you want the truest expression of how it feels to, to be courageous, then you'll choose this incarnation, you know, shall we say. So I think that would be what I would change. I would, um, you have to love yourself so passionately, um, but you're taught to hate yourself every day. So it's just like a catch-22 that is a mother, you know, 
And if I could do all of those things, I would change that. But then you change every part of the experience. You truly begin to know who loves you and who your friends are. You truly begin to know that you want to do this art when you have to fight against those odds. So I, I'd say, you know, that's the good part. I'm an optimist. And naturally, I always have to put a spin on it because I really feel that way. But if I could change that one thing, it would be that, you know, you were allowed to be authentically who you are without having to put everything on the table. Now, a lot of times you don't lose, you gain. And you have tremendous experiences and stories where someone only, you know, you know had, a, had a wellspring of support from family and friends and church and state and everything. But that happens not to be um, the case with the majority. I don't know that I would. I think every experience and every negative and positive experience that I've had has made me part of who I am today. Um, I don't think I'd be as strong as I am, as determined as I am, or as involved as I am had I had it easy or had a nice, you know, picture perfect fairy tale experience. So I think life is sometimes it's pain, and pain is redemptive and humbling. So I, it's definitely made me closer to God, and people would probably uh, think that's strange, but um, it's made me more spiritual. It's made me more uh, in tune to my inner, you know, spirit. So I wouldn't change a thing. Every experience I've had is, is part of who I am today. My major, my major change is like to see more of us come out of the closet. I like to see more, I like to see more faces to the black gay movement. People have to know that we're out there. And I know it's very tough. I will never pull anyone out the closet. People have to come out when they can. But we need to make it safe and we have to see why you should come out. So, yes, time has changed. And it has not changed for the better. It's getting worse. Our young people are dying. Especially in the African American community. Our churches are planted if they they don't see what's going on in their congregation. There's some churches that begin to address the issue. But it's important that we try to take our young people and educate them. Most black people don't want to be considered gay because gay is this whole white thing that has nothing to do with our culture or anything. So to me, it's a way of people saying they're on the DL, it's a way of saying I'm gay without saying I'm gay. Because most of the guys I talk to that say the DL, they have no intention to sleep with women. They don't sleep with women, they don't date women, they have no intention of dating women. You know, and then you have even from the effeminate to the masculine say they're on down low. And to me, it's just another way of us identifying ourselves other than saying I'm gay. It's easy to say I'm on a deal as opposed to saying I'm gay without dealing with all that connotation that goes behind gay. I think that young black gay and lesbian people today are more out than their counterparts from eras past. I think that um, they're having an easier time finding each other, an easier time finding community. And I think one of the nice things about being a young black gay and lesbian person today is that you don't have to turn to the white gay community to come out. I think that you can come out in the context of, of your own people. Um, I think though that one difference from um, the gay and lesbian community of the past is that young black gay and lesbian people today are a little bit less political than their elders were. And I would like to see actually young black gay and lesbian people pick up the threads of political activism that some members of past generations demonstrated? Difficult question because on one hand I think that we, on one hand I applaud 
um, the gay community because I think from when I came out to now, um, the youth are much more visible. Um, they're out there, they're, they're proclaiming their, their gayness and they're proud and they're not ashamed, they're not hiding behind the closets and things like that. But then at the same time, I think that uh, we've stepped back so many different feet with the whole um, DL phenomenon and, and uh, it's, it's so difficult, you know, thinking about where we are right now. Um, my hope is that 10 years from now, we won't be who we are today. Most folks would say that we've evolved. Um, I'd say that uh, we have forgotten our, um, I wouldn't say purpose, I'd say we've, we've gotten off track somewhere along the line. We've lost focus of what's important and uh, we've just become very fragmented. So if we could just get back to, and maybe I'm, be, maybe I'm biased because 10 years ago is you know, kind of like somewhere along the line when I came out and maybe, maybe it seemed that, that things were more impactive or things are more uh, powerful then, but at least they, did, they seemed that way to me. So if we could get more on track in terms of finding the thing that unites us, you know, there, there are several things that all of us can agree upon that need to happen. So if we can get on board with that and create some unity and, um, you know, not be so fragmented and be focused just on a few larger things. You know, we can't change the course of evolution overnight, but if we can just, you know, I always tell folks at the uh, networking brunches, if we can come away with one or two things that we can do to resolve the situation or deal with the issue or heal our community, then, then that's what we need to focus on as opposed to everybody's personal agenda, which is, I think, what we have evolved to. You know, I think people that maybe, well, 10 years ago, um, there wasn't as much language to talk about our realities. I think there's great privilege with language because once you can articulate something, you can look at it, you can examine it, you can see it, you can change it. Words have power. And then also it shifts our own energy to be able to articulate things. So I think that there is more language. We have the privilege of language that people died for. You know, I think that we have more organizations. I think that we're more organized than we were 10 years ago. So we have place. Now we certainly don't have everything that we need and the things that we have are not perfect in any means, but we do have more. Um, I mean, it used to be basically the club and somebody's living room, you know, and before that, that was dangerous, but there was even less of that, you know. Um, but I think that we, we, we have place, we have, we have the privilege of language, and we're a little more organized than we were. And I think we're even starting to come out of our communities, quote unquote, our geographic communities, and connect uh, cross country and internationally. And I think that's going to be our real power. You know, it's interesting. Um, back in the 80s and the 90s, there was sort of this amazing resurgence of black gay art. You had um, filmmakers like Marlon Riggs, you had writers like Essex Hempel, um, you had a number of artists that were out and proud. And then through the whole hip hopization of the black community and the whole ghettoization of our culture, we sort of lost some of that. Um, and so I'm hoping that what's going on now is that with uh, filmmakers like myself and, and Patrick Ian Polk um, and through some of the wonderful writers that are out there that we're having an opportunity to sort of reshape that paradigm and shift some things and sort of see an emergence about being out and being proud um, and talking about who we are and, and displaying those images and telling those stories. I just think that we wouldn't 10 years ago even we weren't sitting in this room, we weren't having this discussion. This wasn't even at the table. Um, we didn't have the empowerment to even begin to consider the fact that, oh, it's imperative that we have our works. I mean, there were certain things, you know, um, and they weren't even done by, um, you know, African American uh, gays or lesbians, but like Paris is Burning and things like that, that began to shed some light on the fascinating communities that are out there. Um, so I just think that that has been important. Um, I think that's significant. Um, I think the steps are slow because, um, you know, we're still asking really 
questions that others have already resolved, you know, in, in terms of is it okay to be who you are, to express that. Um, so, I mean, that's where it takes a little long. We've not even, we've truly just begun a renaissance of that, to have those portrayals, to be bold about them, to not have the, um, I'm making this movie because it's so hard to, uh, to be gay or lesbian. It's, it's evolved to that state. It's like, that's not even open for discussion. That's done. That's history, you know. That's the after school special from 1986, you know. And now it's about, you know, in terms of being in, in the midst of this, how we negotiate it better, love each other better. Um, so I think it's at a definitely, you know, a great place. I think there's a movement going on within the black GLBT community about celebrating who we are, uh, who we are, what we do, and to find out we're just like everyday people. We, we work, we own homes, we have businesses, we have families, and we like to get married legally. And, there are, there are, and we have committed unions. People have been together 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And this is, this is the message that we need to get out. So I think that there's this, a world, there's a countrywide understanding of that that has been, that has been coming up so you'll see black prize across the country they've already started in April and they're going to run through probably in October so that that gives a sense that people want to be black and they want to be out and they want to be prideful about this and with that you'll see that you'll see the you'll see the nightlife and you'll see a lot more empowerment programs and speakers that come in so it's a new way of living and that Above all, we want to be a force to, be, to reckon with because in a political era, era if we see, when, when the politicians can see that we have numbers, then they'll start coming to our table. They'll start, you know, saying, what is going, what can I do for we you? We try to make a difference in our community. Try to educate our young people. Not just the young people, but the old as well. Instill with them that it's okay to have fun. But do it in a safe manner. Be the best that life has to offer. Whether you be that garbage man, that police officer, that nurse. Be the best. Educate yourself in that field. Be the master in that field. That you will not have to ask people to respect you. That you'll be able to do your job. And people will know by your works and by your work you will be respected. stuff is like <laughs> I get asked to speak on that so often it's not like closeted men have not been sleeping around since the beginning of time you know everybody all of a sudden because what's his name JL King I think is came out with his book it's like all of a sudden we have this big phenomena about DL you know they even in my father's generation there have been people that have been married and sleeping with men it's nothing new it's just JL King brought it to light and my take on that, if we as a society, as black people, would accept people for who they are, then they wouldn't have to get married and pretend they're something that they're not. You know, I, I know a number of pastors that have been married and are gay. You know, and, and the wife knows it. It's just that kind of arrangement. And it's nothing new. Um, I, I think it's another rift between black men and black women. Because a lot of the workshops and a lot of speak engagements, you, you have women, well, it's y'all fault. Y'all don't tell us that you sleep with men. I said, but at the same token, you think you say it's all right if you know a husband got a girlfriend down the street. That doesn't make sense to me. You should be upset if, you have a, if it's another woman or another man. It doesn't matter who it is. But 
it's just another rift between black men and black women. And I came here, like I said, 89, 90, and I look at the numbers of black people that were infected with HIV. Back in 1990, I remember we were like maybe 30% of the cases in Georgia. Now we're 72%. You know, that's devastating. And it's not going down. You know, that's just Atlanta. That's a national trend. Uh, you know, because we as black people have so many other issues that, that we're facing, economics, unemployment, you know, poverty. And HIV is just another added burden on that plate, and people just don't take it seriously. You know, there, it goes back to, uh, what is it, Maslow's hierarchy of need. We're going to think about how we're going to have food, shelter, and everything else before we think about, well, I may get infected if I do this, or I may get infected if I do that. And unfortunately, most black gay men don't think their life is worth living anyway. So it's, okay, I'm going to get HIV eventually, and what do I care? It's sooner or later. I think that the download phenomenon and its sensationalism suggests that there's a lot more to sexual identity than we acknowledge. I think there are a lot of points of gray in between gay and straight, and I think that we don't have a well enough developed language of sexuality, of sexual identity, of sexual experience, of sexual desire. I think it also indicates that in the popular imagination, we haven't really decoupled sexuality and gender. Most people assume that if you are attracted to members of the same sex that you are going to have characteristics of the opposite gender and they assume that if you are attracted to members of the opposite sex that you're going to have traditional versions of femininity or masculinity. I think that that's a problematic assumption and the download helps point that out because clearly one of the issues related to the download phenomenon is um, men who want to have sex with men but who want to think of themselves as masculine. I think another issue in the discourse is that a lot of people assume that the down law only applies to men, and I think that it applies as well to women. I think you can find women who are on the down low by all the traditional definitions that are used. Unfortunately, uh, the down low phenomenon is also used as a way to cover up issues of accountability related to um, sexuality and particularly with HIV AIDS. So um, I think that, that the download phenomenon is very interesting. It gives us a lot to talk about and a lot to think about that we haven't even touched on yet. Change about the media. I think I wish there was just more, more honesty and more integrity um, in media as a whole. I think whether it's television, whether it's creative, whether it's documentary work, whether it's the news, there's so much manipulation that goes on. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. I know within our community there's been all the discussion around you know being DL and being on the down low but so much of the information that came out really wasn't information it was scare tactics or stories um, and in some cases outright lies and it never really got to the heart of the issue it never got to the reason why there are men and women out there who aren't comfortable with who it is that they really are there's a reason why people don't come out of their skin so to speak and that's a discussion that I would love for us to have, but unfortunately, in the media, we haven't had an opportunity to have that, because it's more about headlines. It's more about headlines, it's more about opening weekends, it's more about making the best sell New York Times bestseller list, as opposed to actually doing something that speaks to folks. Life is complicated. I'm sure that is a real complicated thing. And, um, you know, women are on the down low too, so speak, and I'm not just talking about men. Uh, you got more church ladies that are just big dykes, married folks. Uh, and I've been with a couple of them. Uh, <laughs> I think that it is a, I think it is the evidence of the effects of oppression. I think if people were free to fully express themselves both in their sexuality and how they adorn themselves and in how they want to live in the world what kind of jobs they want to have if people were truly free to be who they are I don't think there'd be any download there wouldn't be a reason for it so to me it is the evidence that we still have a lot of work to do people ain't free in their own bodies there's too many lies it's, it's not a celebration of love or of sex, really, you know. Uh, I want to celebrate, you know. Um, so I just think that there's work to do. I realize that because the work isn't completely done yet, 
it is also not safe for some people for many reasons because when you are out in your celebration of your sexuality which can change for some people from day to day or from person to person um, from time period to time period there are consequences for that you know uh, you may not get a certain job you may not um, your family may not want to deal with you you know uh, you may lose your status whatever that means to you uh, you you may be subject to violence physical violence um, and most of all you may have to deal with the truth about yourself that may destroy how you've constructed your life you may have to change so I know that it's complicated for people um, and so I don't feel a judgment on it I just see it as as evidence that there's a lot of work to be done <laughs> Hated it. <laughs> no, it is. <clears throat> I do think that the DL, I know that the DL um, uh, phenomenon exists. I know brothers who are on the low. And I don't think that it's for any other reason than they are afraid to open up that their society, their, society, um, their family, um, people at work, whatever, will not accept them for who they are, so they feel they must pretend to be something that they're not. Um, but I hate it. I hate it because it's being, you know, the light is being shined on only one set of people, and that is a black male, and um, <laughs> it's everywhere. What I think is really interesting is that the down low, first off, you know, in, in its defense, it still speaks of back to that whole marginalized thing, the down low is, is men. It never talks about the down low as, as lesbian and how, how it so often is the case. And that's probably been even before men, you know what I'm saying? Because women definitely can negotiate it a little better. Two really close girlfriends who spend all their time together or live together as roommates or sit together at a club all night or, um, you, know, uh, you know, always together with their kids. Oh, you don't see that. I think that's an incredibly fascinating story about that. First off, just to segue to that, that it does exist. You know, married with husbands and kids, with a full-fledged, full-time lover. Um, and so, now the whole download phenomenon leads to the indictment that it is as a result of bisexual download men who are creating the epidemic of AIDS and all of that. So that is a whole different direction that they're taking with it. Um, um, and creating a hysteria about that, but that's all that you know people are seeming to care about, and that's just the only fascinating story. Um, but I, like I said, I think it gets really tried. It's everyone goes in to cash your check because they know it's fascinating, and it fe feeds into I think heterosexual black women's deepest fear, you know, of abandonment, being left, of also the uh, very real and literal threat of um, HIV and possible um, AIDS, and so. Uh, it has them already alert. I think they're the ones consuming it most. You know. uh, I think the media has talked about that with enough. Um, I think it's been exploited to the level that anything can possibly be exploited to. Um, I believe, uh, as Keith Boykin does, we need to get beyond the, bound, the, the down low and deal with some real substantive issues. Uh, nobody ever wanted to be in the closet. If society was indicative of what we say it's about and this country held true to its ideals and, and true purpose, then there would never be a down low or any need for anyone to be in the closet. They're in the closet because they don't feel safe and they don't feel loved or feel that they will be accepted, especially within our community. So we have a lot of work to do in respect to that. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a, an individual with a lot of baggage. What you're doing is trying to hide who you are. You're living a miserable life. You're trying to please somebody else. You've gotten married. You've had kids. You're trying to put this big family scene together. And now you're miserable. And you're going out in the left field trying to hide what you're doing. So you want to classify yourself as on the DL. You're vicious. And you need to be honest with yourself.
about my job is that I get to teach an African American lesbian and gay class. Um, to my knowledge, it's one of the few such courses in the country, and I feel very proud and delighted to be able to offer it because I think that it really enriches the collegiate experience of the black, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer students. So the first thing that I try to convey is just that we have a glorious history. You know, a lot of times the figures that have been important to our community have been suppressed, or if they haven't been suppressed, then their sexuality has been suppressed. And I like young people to know who our heroes are. Um, I like young people to know the things that we've done, the contributions that we've made to larger histories. So that's the main thing I try to convey. Um, the other thing that I try to convey is just self-love. You know, as I said, I see a lot of young people struggling with internalized homophobia, and I try to do everything I can to go against that and help them realize what a wonderful experience it is to be a queer person of color. Um, I would tell the next generation of filmmakers to do your thing, to not let anything stop you. You don't need a million dollars. You don't need a big name star. Um, pick up a camera. I don't care what kind of camera it is and begin to shoot and tell your stories and cut them together. Um, whether it's a five minute film, a two hour film, whether it's a five hour epic costume drama, whatever it is, tell your stories because no one else can take the place of your voice. And if you don't speak, if you don't sing, if you don't dance, if you don't write, if you don't make your film, then no one else will be able to do that. And that's something terrible that we would have lost. To be true to yourself, to be true to your inner power, to find out who you are as a person, use your skills to make the world better. And as you go through, you fall in love with your inner power, you fall in love with yourself, and you love people around you. You you take the courage to be who you are, be it gay or, or bisexual or transgender, and use that sense, that special type of love, and know that you're special for others to know, and that we need you to come out. And I think the younger people get it. They, they are coming out, and they are proud of it, and they are happy, um, and, they, and they're strong about it. And I, because I said it some, with some, some uh, students at, at Georgia State, that they, they understand what their blackness is, they understand what their gayness is, and they're going to make it work. And, and they're having conversations with their parents a lot sooner, and their parents are a lot more accepting. Some aren't, but they're a lot more accepting. So they don't feel some of the same chains that was on generations before. So I always encourage them to keep their inner strength, know who they are. Um, we're we're going to make mistakes as, as young people, but just find an older mentor, and then also be there for yourself so you can learn, take it in, and then bring somebody up. Tell so. your stories. Don't let anyone stop you from doing what it is that you need to do to show what life is to you and how, because one of the things I always say is that, tell, tell aspiring writers, is that people are waiting to hear your voice. You know, you, you hear the voice that's out there, you, you see the voice that's out there, and you think, okay, what can, I, what can I contribute? Oh, I don't have anything to contribute. And to me, that's just a crop of shit, because you do have something to contribute, and that's where I was. And as soon as I put it out there, the universe, you know, sent people running, to it and then back to me saying hey you know this is this is my life this is who I am and you know people are waiting and it's your responsibility to give it to them and so do it don't sit around and, and hope and wish and pray just do it I love that slogan my Nike just do it do it be bold about it um, don't settle for the first draft um, write and fine tune. Um, I hate to be like this, but it's almost like, as, as blacks, we were told, you got to be 10 times better. Oh, you want to be a black, you know, gay or lesbian filmmaker? It has got to be an incredible script. It's got to be phenomenal acting. And it has got to be a vision that stays the course. And you have got to wrestle all the support you can possibly have. And you have got to hustle your project. Um, and, you know, you have got to know your craft. You've got to master as best you can every facet of filmmaking. Um, and you have got to, you know, boldly and blindly, you know, throw yourself out there and be ready, you know what I'm saying? Um, so you have to be ten times better and ten times tougher. But I think, you know, I think you knew that already. I always tell folks I do daily thoughts. Um, 
you know, uh, this is part of my email ministry, uh, my contribution to our spiritual nourishment, because I think part of that healing we talk about, we have to heal, heal spiritually as well, uh, inside and outside the black church. So I always tell folks to be encouraged, um, um, be empowered, and, um, you know, be hopeful. You know, change will happen. It doesn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight in the 60s. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, uh, the immense, you know, patient uh, process. You know, everything takes time. And uh, just to be encouraged, be hopeful, you know, and be empowered. I would say hone your craft. Study the people that did it before you. You don't have to go to school to do that. Read. There's a lot of stuff on audio, both interviews and the spoken word. Study. Learn your craft. Focus on the craft. A lot of people, they know they have the gift and they have a lot of energy and they come busting out and they're not ready. You got to work for that. You know, like for instance in jazz, the musician has to be sharp. If not, the combo ain't going to work. The music ain't going to sound right. So you got you to gotta work on your craft and focus on the work and figure out what your personal mission is and responsibility and desire is for the work and just do it. You can't sit around crying and moaning because somebody's not doing something for you, you have to do it. And while you're focused on doing the work, and if you have done your work of, of working on your craft, things will happen, you know, doors will open, and it takes time. And I would say also find your, your tribe, find your community, and, and seek support. And when people ask me about getting into the industry, you know, I try to talk them out of it, I'll be honest, because my Number one goal for a young person to get his education. That's important to me. When you get your education, you have something to fall back on. And it's important that you know what you're getting yourself into. I argue that black lesbian feminists have been at the center of contemporary feminism, both in terms of theory and activism. I think that if you take a look at particularly things that have happened during the second wave and beyond, that, that black lesbian feminists have been crucial to the perspectives that have evolved and um, that virtually any trend in feminism today can be traced to black lesbian feminists. So I believe is my legacy, a huge statue that says Maurice Jamal at the foot of every major city in the country. Um, no, seriously, that's exactly what I like to leave. But uh, I mean, I think a body of work, I think a body of film and television work that has really opened the door um, on the black community, um, that really shows things that we've never seen before, and not just gay and lesbian stories, but has really, really shows families and motherhood and fathers and relationships between siblings and rich folks and poor folks. Um, I just want to tell really good films and really good stories that speak to people regardless of race that touch you on the inside. And if I can do that, then I think I've done something wonderful. A mark in the placement of the aesthetic of jazz and theater, like like a, a little more opening. You know, I want to I want to open the door just a little more for that, so that hopefully the next person can just kick that thing down. You know. Um, and I guess uh, the dream, the action, along with the dream, the hope of people coming together across all the artificial constructed lines and boxes that society has created to keep us apart. Now Christopher David was the type of man that tried to love everyone he came into contact with. Um, that I was open to learning something new every single day. Um, that's my goal, uh, to continuously, I would grow um, and, and just try to love and be happy. That's what I want to leave. I want people to look back on me and smile when they think about me. 
if I should go this year, tomorrow, today, um, you know, it's just the theme is, you know, boldness, um, to, uh, to never feel that, to feel a certain sense of entitlement that your story is worth telling, and that if you want something bad enough, you do what I did, you do it all, you know what I'm saying, I have no I'm a very simplistic person. Again, I didn't get into this for fanfare, vanglory. I just got into this to help create change, to use myself to make a difference. Uh, if I can, if someone can say when I'm gone and you know uh, away from here that uh, I made a difference and I helped someone and their community is a better place because of something that I did, I'm okay. And I had to find out, am I really all right? Because if I listen to some people, I'm not all right. So I did my own personal quest and to know that I am loved by God and God loves me. That's all I need. It is a lifetime journey. Even though I'm retired, those movies are still there. They're still silent all over the world. At the close of my life, when they put me to the those movies are still silent. They still there.